Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, the, this is the uh, agenda for, I'm going to talk about you know, when water skiing was actually invented here in Minnesota, show you pictures of Ralph Samuelson and, and so forth. And then I'm going to come to specific things about Lake Minnetonka, the ski show troops, uh, the whiz kids, the aquabats, and the ski antics are all uh, show skiing groups were operating between the late 1940s and about 1957. And uh, we have in the room uh, Karen Sherman, who was one of the whiz kids. So uh, right over there with your hand up. And then who actually lives here at Lake Minnetonka Shores. And then uh, water ski clubs, the Silver Spray Ski Club, the Wyzetta Bay Ski Club, and the Minnetonka Ski Club. So if you go back to the olden days, uh, people were, if you wanted to move across water, you had to have a sailboat or you had to have uh, oars or paddles or you had to uh, pole. So here's some examples of, of how you used to go across water if you were a person. And then, uh, because back then there, there weren't any motors, there was no steam engine, there was no in, uh, internal combustion engine. Here, we'll go back 500 years. This is a Leonardo da Vinci drawing of, you can see a human there with some kind of things on their feet and paddling along, trying to get along the water. But eventually, motors were invented. And uh, because motors and boats, boats weren't very fast and motors weren't very powerful back in the early days in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so to get on the water, this is an aquaplane. So you need a lot of planing surface to, uh, to have a human being stand up and, st and to support their weight. So here's a, here's a fun one. This is uh, you know, a, preacher, a preacher allegedly trying to marry somebody who are operating on aquaplanes. So Ralph Samuelson, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He in, is credited with being the first water skier. It was on Lake Pepin down in uh, Lake City. He was a curious and adventurous guy and he was determined to ski on water. And he first tried to ski using snow skis. And remember that motors weren't very powerful and boats weren't very fast. And of course, a snow ski has very little planing surface. He tried barrel staves. That didn't work. So he went to the lumber yard and bought two big planks about 10 feet long and 10 inches wide, took them home to the kitchen, got the family copper pot got boiling water, put the ends in the boiling water so he could tip the ends up. And then he put some, uh, some straps, little leather or fabric where he could stick his foot in. And off he went to try to water ski. And no one had ever done it before. So he tried about 25 times and he got dragged over on his face over and over again till he realized, I've got to put the tips of the skis up out of the water. And he finally figured it out. And then here he is. July 2nd, 1922. Now, look at, he went to the hardware store. This is a piece of rope he bought. And this is just a metal ring that he bought at the hardware store. And he wrapped it up with tape. And that was his handle to, to water ski. And you can see down here, if you can see, just a strap of fabric of some kind to, uh, to ski with, to put his feet in. Here's a picture of of Ralph with one of those pairs of skis. Uh, and there's actually two sets of skis of his that I have seen. One is in uh, the Minnesota Historical Society and one is in the American Water Skiing uh, Museum down near Orlando, Florida. Uh, and uh, let's see. Ralph was also determined, he wanted to, to ski jump. And so some of us have had uh, a floating ramp where you can go out a swim raft and supported by four barrels. And so Ralph said, what well, if I took two barrels out, that end of the ramp would fall down into the water and I could have a ski jump. So he did that and he was the first ski jumper. Here's a, oh, here's a picture of the, the water, this water skis from the Hall of Fame. And you can see just a little leather strap. That's all there was to put your foot in. Here he is a couple years later, uh, going off a jump. This is not the jump with the barrels underneath it. But here the, the legend says it was uh, five feet high 
And of course, it's not five feet high. But anyway, he was the first person to, uh, to, to go off a ski jump. He was also credited, I, I call it, with speed skiing. He, he got pulled behind a float plane going up to 80 miles an hour. And uh, that was pretty wild in 1925. Here's a picture of the, uh, the first patented water ski. This is the aqua ski patented in 1925. This is, these are ropes, there were, these skis were attached, the front of the ski had a rope attached to the boat. So then in the skier had another rope that was sort of like an aquaplane where the, you have a handle on the aquaplane and then the, the aquaplane is towed by the boat. But these were from the uh, Water Skiing Hall of Fame uh, uh, down in Florida. I'm going to go through these uh, show ski groups. And the first one is, is the Whiz Kids. And the Whiz Kids uh, uh, came out of Mound. In fact, I'll show you the pictures and Karen can maybe chime in. But Pat Sr. and Evelyn Guy owned the casino in Mound. Some of you remember the casino currently called Surfside. Currently now it's a, a living quarters, but the casino was a, a restaurant, a bar, a roller skater rink, a marina, and a bowling alley all in one. And so uh, here are Pat and Evelyn Guy out on their dock, and there's, of course, the gas pump. In 1949, Pat and Evelyn bought uh, water skis for the kids. And then they went a couple years later to Tommy Bartlett's water ski show in Wisconsin Dells. And they thought, what a great thing to see people going off jumps and building pyramids and barefooting and skiing backwards, all the things that you see in a, in a show ski. And so they hired a guy named Lee Martin and brought him to Mound to be the coach for the kids in the Whiz Kids. Uh, they had a Higgins inboard and they traveled around to Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin. Here are the names of the people who were Whiz Kids. And I remember meeting Isla Lee Christensen when I was little. And then I met Johnny Rosh too. Johnny Rosh was a terrific uh, jumper and all around skier. And here's Karen Sherman's name down there, the one who's sitting in the back row here. And uh, so here are other members of the Whiz Kids. So you've got Pat and Evelyn and Lee Martin and the coach. But look at over here who was an announcer sometimes. Remember Mel Jazz? And Ed Bidwell, too, was sometimes associated. And he was a member of the other, uh, one of the other ski troops. And I've talked numerous times with Ed. Here's a picture of uh, Pat Guy Sr. with, with Bev and, and Gretchen, two of the Whiz Kids. Here's three of the young women that were part of the Whiz Kids in their, I don't know, tutus? What do you call them? Here's Gretchen Rosh with, uh, with a pair of skis. Here are eight girls. Uh, and you can read their names. Great picture. And in the background, it looks like a, a Falls Flyer boat if you're into old boats. It looks like the front end of a Falls Flyer, which are pretty rare boats. Another one of Gretchen. And it's a White Bear Lake, White Bear made skis. And that was a White Bear ski. Here's Isla Lee. Sally Nival. Now, one thing I'll point out to you here it says Ski Antics. One of the other ski troops were called the Ski Antics, and it was uh, Frank Bedore's ski troop. And he had his own skis made, as did the Whiz Kids. So, Here's, get some action pictures here. Here's, here's some of the guys. Apparently they had a show in Prescott, Wisconsin. Now we'll see some action photos. Here's, and this is, this is uh, right outside of Surfside. If you look over there, that's, you know, that's the west side of Phelps Island. So uh, Johnny Rosh going, or Dick Hoppenroth going off the jump and the other two going around the side of the jump. Johnny Rosh doing a headstand on a saucer. These are all show tricks that you know that people like to see. Here's Johnny Rosh hanging by his feet, uh, being with two guys, you know, on a, a pole. 
And every uh, ski troop had a clown or a clown act. So here's Dick Hoppenroth dressed up as a clown. Lee Martin is doing a 360 helicopter. You go off the jump forward and you do a 360 and you land forward. Here's Lee Martin barefooting. If you've ever uh, done barefooting, this boat was not very powerful because he's getting way too much spray. And boats back 1953, 54, that Higgins had a six cylinder engine. It probably didn't go quite fast enough for a big guy like Lee. Here's Pat Guy Jr. And uh, he was a, a great skier. And he, uh, here's Pat, another shot of him. Probably on the, it's probably Phelps Island in the background. These two were known as the Gold Dust Twins, I guess, right, Karen? <laughs> so here's, uh, here's Karen on the left, and uh, Isla, Isla Lee and Marcia. The two on the, on the right are going over the jump, and then Karen going, went around the jump. They're all practicing over on Cook's Bay, and then they, they go on tour. This is uh, Marsha Guy, and this was a, taken at the Bald Eagle Ski Tournament, as you can tell, in 1955. And Marsha, uh, in that same era, set a state record uh, for the longest jump by a woman. And Marsha now lives in, oh, in Wisconsin, right? She lives over Rhinelander, Wisconsin. She was going to try to come today, but it's a long drive. Here's uh, what they called fast takeoff. We got three of the skiers taking off kind of one at a time from the dock, and that would be Cook's Bay. That would be right in front of the Surfside or the casino. Here are three of the women in their little tutu outfits holding the rope with the heel. Here's a, a three-person pyramid. Here is Gretchen on a saucer, and the saucer is, you know, you can turn around and go backwards and has no fins on the bottom, so it's pr pretty fun. Here's Johnny Roche barefooting. Uh, Johnny Roche was one of the best jumpers in the country. He, uh, back when, in the mid-50s, when the best jumpers in the world were jumping, you know, 125, 126, 127 feet, he was right near there. He, and he, he placed high in national tournaments. Here are four, four young women doing this, what they call the skier salute. So you ski on one ski and you lift the other ski up like this. Also part of uh, every ski show was uh, somebody who goes off the jump and kicks off the skis and does a, a flip or two and crash lands. And the, you know, the cr crowd loves to see dangerous things going on. So here's uh, Lee Martin going over, and then Pat Guy goes around the jump and cuts under and lands on and, and the jumper. He skis on the other side. In the background, you'll see a float plane. There's Hard Scrabble Point, right? And those two going off the jump. You can see the jump is supported by barrels, and it's very narrow compared to modern jumps. This is a, a, called a duck, and this is an amphibious vehicle. You, you can see it has wheels that you can drive it on the highway, and then you can drive it right into the lake, and it floats and has both wheels and propellers. So they load it up and take it on the road, and the jump that they had would, would as I recall, it would fold up and had wheels underneath it so they could transport their jump on a highway to take it to uh, the next site. This is from the, uh, the, your museum, this is, you can see right here, it says Whiz Kids. This is uh, one of the Whiz Kids skis that they used, and uh, it's in the museum that, that Brad talked about and, and so forth, just down the road from here. Here's a sticker that uh, they called Casino Water Skiing, or a patch. So after the Whiz Kids, the Whiz Kids went on till about 1957, as I recall. Afterwards, Gretchen and Johnny Roche went to ski it at the Cypress Garden Ski Show. And I mentioned Johnny Roche was one of the top jumpers in the country. Marsha Guy went on to ski with Tommy Bartlett in Wisconsin Dells. 
and then to a, a second ski troop in Mays Landing, New Jersey. And where are they now? This is from a couple of years ago. So Marcia lives in Rhinelander. She's a nationally ranked tennis player, still plays at the highest level at, at the national level. Gretchen Rosh still lives in Mound, or did. Karen Sherman, when I did this, lived in Rockford. Now she lives here. Isla Lee lives in Acapulco. Ed Bidwell, he left town in about 1961, became a college professor in California and has lived there ever since. He lives in Westlake Village. Jo Johnny Rosh is deceased, and that was all I could find when I did this, uh, did this research. So the Aquabats. It started in 1948, this group, by Ed Bidwell and Don Russell. They were two college students. And the Bidwell family lived on Gideon's Bay, on the east side of Gideon's Bay, like in Excelsior. And they had a house on the lake uh, at the end of Second Street. And that family had lived there since the 1860s. Uh, and I wanted to tell you a little story. The, the first person from Minnesota to ski in a national championship was in 1946, a guy named Roy Greenhill. But in 1947, two people went to the national championships, and it was Ed and Don. And so I was talking to them about, well, it was, and that championship was in Michigan. So I said, well, tell me, tell me about that. How, how did you get there? And so Don said, well, Ed had money, so he took the bus. <laughs> I didn't have any money, so I hitchhiked. Oh, wow. He hitchhiked to Michigan. Well, how did you take your skis? And he said, we didn't take our skis. We, we got to the site and we borrowed skis. Wow, early days of national championships. Anyway, two great guys that uh, sent me their, uh, I, I got to go through their photos and get pictures and copies of their photos and listen to their history. So these are the names of the skiers in the Aquabat Club. Ed and Don who, who uh, started it. And then later on, uh, sold it to a couple of the other guys. And Betty Jean Larson was actually a BJ, used to be part owner of Eagle Island, if you know where that is on the upper lake, and also was married to one of the Lillehighs, one of the doctors of the famous heart surgeons. So it was BJ Lillehi until the end of her life. Other Aquabat members, and I'll just point out Cleland Card, Axel, remember Cleland Card, Axel and his dog. He was an MC sometimes for these guys. Here's uh, the two founders, Don and Ed, going off a jump. You know, no life jackets, of course. You know, a jumper today, jumps, jumping is very different today. Jumpers today, uh, men jumpers ski at 35 miles an hour, and they do a double weight cut, and they hit the ramp at about 70, and they actually land further down the lake than the boat, they're going so fast. And uh, when things go wrong and they're wearing full wetsuits, uh, helmets, knee braces, and when things go wrong, it's like a really bad yard sale. I've seen friends, friends get really badly hurt. Anyway, here's uh, Don Russell skiing backwards at night. I think this is a show on Lake Pepin, and he's, he's got the, the men wore the striped swimsuits. Here are three of them doing another kind of a trick, holding the handle with your heel and holding one ski overhead. Here's another similar one that you saw Johnny Rosh kind of, this is BJ hanging upside down by her knees on a pole. I think this is also Lake Pepin. And this is, so Willie, Willie White is going over the jump and Don Russell is cutting underneath and uh, Willie jumps over him. And this is, uh, I think, also Lake Pepin. I'm not sure who that skier is. Here's, uh, looks like a woman sitting on the, sh or riding on the shoulders of a guy. I think that is also Lake Pepin. Don Russell, this is Don doing a flip. He told me he tried that trick many, many times and never landed it. He always, he always crash landed it. 
And this is a picture of the jump, and somebody's sitting on the jump, and I don't know who that particular person is. This is a picture, uh, this is in Gideon's Bay. This is Excelsior, you know, the end of the, end of the commons here, in Big Island and Gales Island over here. But this is where the Bidwell's house was, was on that side of Gideon's Bay. So you've got, looks like a, a, a guy with maybe a, a woman on the shoulders. Now I'm going to go to the Ski Antics. This is the, the group founded by Frankie Bedore. And how Frankie got involved in this is he, they had a cabin up in Wisconsin. And he decided to take a motorcycle trip to South America. And he decided to take his dog with him. And the motorcycle had a sidecar, so that's where the dog sat. So he goes to South America. On his way back, curiously, he ends up in Cypress Gardens, Florida. It's not exactly a direct route back to Wisconsin or Minnesota. And they saw the Cypress Gardens ski show, and they just got intrigued by how fun it looked and how uh, entertaining it was. So they came back to their cabin in Wisconsin and started the ski antics, and they operated from 1951 to 1957. And I've got all the records of Frank's. You know, he's got three ring binders with all the glossy photographs of all the skiers. He had, at one point, 33 men and 19 women in, in the group along with photographers and drivers and uh, announcers. And uh, Frank lived, later in life, he lived on what's now called uh, Palmer Point. You might remember the big gray house that ran across that lake lakeshore. Um, but they had shows in five different states, including uh, Lake Minnetonka, Lake Calhoun, Brainerd. They did aquatennial shows for six years. And they did the, a show in Wyzetta Bay for Wyzetta's 100th anniversary. I think that was 1954, in front of what was called Hart's Cafe at the time. So here's some pictures. This is a picture of Frank over here and some of his uh, skiers. And it's a Correct Craft inboard ski boat. There. A Correct Craft uh, Adam, I think, was the model. And there they've got their name on the. Frank was big into advertising and marketing. and. I'll tell you more stories about that. So you've got the announcer, and he's got several pictures of aquatennial queens that they would get skiing and even get up on a pyramid. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So this is uh, Frankie with, you know, with the white robe on, and then his sister Judy, two others. Same picture, pretty much, but this one's in color. This is on Lake Calhoun, and look at the crowd. This is on the east shore of Lake Calhoun, and uh, two women getting up. And uh, I'll show you other pictures from Lake Calhoun. But look at them. Look at how many people are lined up along the shore. Frankie had uh, a good way of advertising and entertaining. So this is uh, just a show of a bunch of the group, and you'll see these. Four guys up here with instruments. They'll ski with the, and play with those instruments, and I'll show you a picture. So this is, uh, you can see again here, the ski antic skis that Frankie had made and branded for his team. And here's a couple of the, the skiettes, they're called, the two women that put the handle between their, behind their thighs and ski along like that. Now, who, who would recognize that building back there? That's the Calhoun Beach Club. This is Lake Calhoun. So here are the skiettes again. There were, again, there were up to 19 women in the group. And Judy Bedore was Frank's sister. This is one of the Aquatennial Queens. Uh, Betty Bar Barnhart, who they would talk into coming and skiing and so forth. And here's a pyramid. And that's uh, the Aquitennial Queen, Joanne Melberg, from 1953. Another one from Lake Calhoun. Look at the crowds. Uh, 
another part of the entertainment, he had these two little water skimmers racing around. Another part of the entertainment and uh, advertising, you get the big flood, flood lights that goes up into the sky and people follow it, drive over to find what's, what's at the bottom of this beam of light and it would be Frankie. Here are the, the par, these four guys were called par four and these are the instruments that they would play and I've got a picture of them skiing while playing those instruments. So, Again, Frankie was very much an entertainer and a creative wizard. Here they are, it's not a great picture, but these are the four guys playing their trumpets and trombones and while they're skiing. This is a backward swan. Pretty common thing to see in a ski troop. Here you again on Lake Calhoun with uh, Calhoun Beach Club in the background. Two women on the shoulders of two men. And this is Frankie with his sister Judy on top. And the, the same pair uh, about that same year. There's uh, another duo. Always got to have a clown. So here's Dick riding old Bess, some kind of a horse. And you can see the jump in the background, and it's you know it's very crude, a very crude jump by any modern standard. But they had to have them built so that they could transport them. So they somehow they folded up, and you could with wheels underneath them. Bobby Ellis uh, was part of the group. You can see that he had an amputated leg, but uh, he was part of the group. Uh, here's a question for you, Danny Stevens. Danny Stevens, a little, he was 10 years old then, but he was a rock and roller. Does anybody remember the band that he ran? It's called Danny's Reasons, if you've ever heard of that band from back in the, probably the 60s. I met Danny once, way back when, but, uh, so he was part of Frank's group. He, you know, this is what happens when you go off a jump sometimes. You, you crash and burn. Frankie was always having fun. You can see the, the eternal smile on his face. On his face. The over and under, which again you've seen the other ski troops. Uh, the the jump, jumper goes over the jump, and the other person cuts from one side to the other. And here's a double over and under. And here's three guys going off to jump. And here's the, crash, the, cl the clown doing a crash landing. And a flip off the jump. But, but it's sort of just you kick off the skis and do a flip. Part of entertaining the crowd of people. This is another helicopter, the 360, where you go off forwards, do a 360 in the air, and land frontwards if you're lucky. Bare, barefooting is always part of it. You know, barefooting, in the, when it was first invented in the late 40s, just skiing barefoot is, is pretty cool and pretty hard. And it's evolved over and over again, where now people are skiing backwards barefoot. They're doing tumble turns, and they're, they're going off small jumps and jumping 100 feet and landing barefoot, if you can believe it. And doing tricks, crossing the wake, going backwards, Etc. So barefooting was pretty uh, simple back in this day. So here's Frankie as the drunken skier. You can see him in a tuxedo and pretending to be out of control and going off the jump and crashing. And we're coming up to one of my favorite, uh, oh, here's a close-up of that one. And Frankie's dog that went on the trip to South America, the name was Rowdy. There's a picture of Rowdy on an aquaplane. Frankie saw a uh, kite flying down in, uh, in Cypress Gardens. It was a pretty new thing back in those days, and so he brought that up here to the, to the Midwest. And that was part of, you know, ski flying was part of, uh, part of the, kind of exciting, kind of new. 
This is my favorite slide. So I'll, I'll set it up this way. So, so you've, you, you've got the jump, and you want to really entertain the people, right? So you, you take uh, oil, and you spread it all over in front of the jump. Then you light it on fire. And then Frankie goes over the jump, through the smoke, through the flames, and lands, and the crowd cheers. So here's the picture. If you can imagine even thinking about this any t day like today. <laughs> So, how about that for a trick? We're the environmentalists, you know, back in 1954. <laughs> this is the Ski Antic Ski. You can see it's uh, got the name here. And Frankie had those made here. It's by the Bleeker Kaler Company. And this is a stock certificate. Here it says, you know, Frank Bedore issues this stock to Bill Merrill, who is one of the crowd. Uh, shares worth $10. And this was in 1953. Here's one of the brochures. This is the first year they were in, uh, in Operation 51. And there, I've got brochures from other places that they went. And, and, and you open up inside, and it would show you all the different uh, tricks and groups and pyramids and jumping and dogs. And everything would just be out and laid out and just like a, a normal show. So Frank, this is off of the, the ski antics now, but Frank decided in uh, early 1953, he was going to ski down the Mississippi River. He started in Minneapolis, and he ended up in New Orleans. And it's, uh, it's about a 1,200-mile trip. Now, Frankie was an advertising guy, so he called it an 1,800-mile trip, but it was actually a 1,200-mile trip. And he was, uh, he was sponsored by Evan Rood Motors, um, Alumacraft Boats and the Brainerd Niswa Tourist Association. So he had an Evan Rood boat and he had an Evan Rood motor and an Alumacraft boat and he had a Paul Bunyan outfit that he would wear. I'll show you a picture. And on the front of the boat was a paper mache of Babe the Blue Ox. So they, they and he was a showman, right? And so and then he would be skiing, and the boat would be driving, and they had all sorts of gas cans, and then there'd be cars driving along the road with spare parts and food and so forth and so on. But Frank had it all mapped out. When he'd get to Des Moines, he'd stop there for, for the night or whatever, and of course he'd have the mayor there and the city council and the cameras from the TV stations everywhere along the way, because that's what Frank does. So here, uh, oh, Mobile Oil was another... Uh, another sponsor. So uh, he left on May 10th and arrived on May 29th, and he set a world record. One day he skied 229 miles in nine hours and 10 minutes. So uh, pretty amazing. Sorry? Well, yeah, when you get to St. Louis, you got to go, you got to walk around the locks and dams, I guess, or, uh, I guess, or maybe he'd get in the boat and the boat would go through the lock and get to the new level. I don't have a good answer, I'm just guessing. So here's a picture of the Evinrude and the Lumacraft, and you can see there's Rowdy, and there's Babe the Blue Ox, and this is prepare for the 1800 mile trip. Now, maybe. As you drive it in a car, it's 1,200 miles. But you know the Mississippi River does, does. So maybe Frankie's somewhat right. Here he is with his uh, Paul Bunyan outfit and a pair of his skis. Here he is with the boat. Looks like they're ready to take off with two boat drivers and lots of gas. And here's from the Minneapolis Star. That was the, you know, the Star was the evening paper. The Tribune was the morning paper. Here he lives, lives on his ski trip. Skis again. Let's talk a little bit about, about ski clubs. We know quite a bit about the Silver Spray Ski Club, not so much about the other two, but they were clubs I uncovered doing my research. So we'll start. Uh, Silver Spray Ski Club started in 1954. Here are the names of the people in the picture. And you'd, uh, I've mentioned Ed Bidwell's name before. He was part of the Whiz Kids at, from time to time. Uh, and you can see they've got their embroidered sweat, uh, uh, 
sweatshirts. I had one of those once too. I was a member back then, not then, but a little later. And, and then in 58, there was a Smithtown Bay contingent that joined, and, and Al Tollefson, who I talked to yesterday, and I'll show you some things about Al. He was a great, great guy, still is. Uh, but Bill Mason, Dr. Jake Strickler, the Thompson brothers, uh, Mitchells, there, there's my name, the Orbecks. So there's a bunch of uh, Silver Spray Ski Club members that started in about 1958. Here's a picture from 1960. This is, the, this is the Smithtown Bay here, and this is the channel that runs over into Lake Virginia. And Al Tollison and the, and the Thompsons lived in the area, and they built a new, a new ski jump. And they're wheeling it down into uh, Smithtown Bay in this picture. Al Tollison was one of the best jumpers in the country. And I mentioned Johnny Roche earlier. But in, I think it was 1959, the best jumpers in the world were jumping 128 feet, 127 feet, and Al was jumping 125 feet. You know, he was right in the mix with the best jumpers in the world. And I, I won't get into this, uh, but some of you probably know this. Al had a very bad accident with, in jumping this same summer in July of 1960. He, he had been... Uh, he had not been feeling well and he was taking a practice jump and he was crossing the wakes. Uh, he kind of blacked out and he ended up going right into the side of the jump and he busted a lot of bones and I went and saw him in the hospital and he was in the cast and it seemed like from his ankles to his neck. But he's recovered, he's, uh, I still see him once in a while. So Al Tollefson was, a, here's a picture of Laurie Thompson. The, they were kind of the next door neighbors, Gary Thompson, Ronnie Thompson, Lori Thompson, He's running through the slalom course. Here's Christine Orbeck with a couple of awards, and she's, uh, if, if, I don't know if you're interested, but Northland skis were made in St. Paul, and this was a Northland slalom ski that a lot of us had back in the day. This is uh, other neighbors of Al's, Billy Mitchell, Gary Thompson, John Strickler, Mary Mitchell, and then some dog. <laughs> Gary Thompson, uh, a few years later. I'm going to talk a water ski club. I read about, and I, t I talked to a guy named David Field. David Field, and, and right down here it says, a member of the newly formed Minnetonka Water Ski Club. And I talked to David, and I said, who was that club, and who were the members, and what did you do, and where were you headquartered, and where did you ski, and uh, he didn't really know any answers to that. But th this was in the paper, and if you read the text, it says that he, was, he skied on Tuesday, April 16th, four days before the ice was officially out. And apparently some of these guys in Wyzetta would have a contest. Who's going to ski, you know, who can ski earliest before the ice is out? So we don't know much about that. Uh, uh, Minnetonka Water Ski Club, other than it's mentioned in this picture. Wayzata Bay Ski Club sponsored a water ski endurance race in 1957. Six skiers, six boats went around and around and around in Wayzata Bay until there's only one skier left, and that skier was Chuck Rosenberger. I talked to Chuck, uh, and Frank Bedore placed second, and I asked Chuck, well, how did you win? And he said, back in those days, a lot of uh, uh, ski hand ropes had two handles instead of one. He said, I, I could save the strength of my arms by putting my hands behind my back so that I wouldn't have to use all the muscles in my shoulders and arms and hands. And so he, he won that contest. And that's about all we could find out about the Wayzata Bay Ski Club. Now, here's this, this is a little fun part. I'm going to show you and you tell me if you know who this is. How about this? Fonzie. How about that? Paul McCartney. How about that? Clint Eastwood. How about that one? John Wayne. This is Carolyn Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy. And it looks like Carolyn is not wearing a life jacket. 
And this one, the one on the right is Jacqueline Kennedy, and she's skiing with her good friend, astronaut John Glenn. Oh, there's an elephant skiing, how about that? Randy Raby was a, a great barefooter back in the day. I always liked that picture, so I'm showing you that one, too. Is it possible to go back to the elephant? Sorry? Can you go back to the elephant? Uh-huh. No, no, I think it is a real elephant. Is it? What, yeah. what are they on? Well, I think it, they just built a giant platform that'll support, you know, 10,000 pounds. And then make it look like water skis. And they must have a, a powerful boat. Yeah. It looks like it has, you know, chains around it from its neck and, and around its, you know, back leg. It looks like it's a real elephant, unfortunately. Randy Raby, so here's, you know, another thing to entertain, you're gonna entertain people, right? So it's, there, there's a witch going on. And Santa on hydrofoils. Meanwhile in Canada, we, we don't need a boat. And let's have advertise that, that water skiers drink bourbon. Okay. And you can find ads where they smoke camel cigarettes, you know, back in the 50s, you know. That's the end of the show. So. <laughs>